Welcome back, everybody. Um, welcome to Celebrating Indigenous Wisdom for Modern Challenges. This is our, um, I believe this is our third section of the day. It's either the second or third section of the day. We've been going since 8 o'clock Colorado time this morning. And we'll be going until about 8.30 this evening, Colorado time. But right now, um, I have the pleasure of introducing Karenna Gore, the founder of the Center for Earth Ethics. Thank you so much for joining us today, Karenna. I know your schedule's busy, so when you said yes, you would love to join us, I was just so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia. It is such a pleasure to be with you, and uh, I'm honored to be part of this extraordinary gathering. I want to say thank you to you and also to Her Many Voices for hosting this beautiful event. And also I wanna say happy Earth Day. Earth Day is a very significant day. It's, it's not a random uh, sort of hallmark designation of a holiday. It really does mark a time um, 51 years ago today in which there was a new wave of awareness around uh, the fact that we share um, this home, this beautiful living planet, and it is under threat. And the first Earth Day uh, did lead to new laws and policies, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the National Environmental Policy Act. I'm speaking from the, the United States of America context, um, which is my, my context. Um, the awareness around Earth Day really did galvanize real change. And yet we are now in a time where more than ever we need to come together and have a new phase of that movement. I am Karenna Gore. I am the founder and director of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary. The path that I took that led me to be right here right now is that I was very worried about the climate crisis. And I learned that the two main drivers, they call them megatrends, were depletion and pollution. The depletion of the forests and the wetlands and the soils that absorb carbon naturally. And at the same time, the pollution, all of this uh, coming from the industrial processes and systems that goes into this thin shell of atmosphere that we see as the sky, but has a limit in which uh, these gases can build up. And we have seen already um, that the weather patterns change as a result. We have the, the stronger storms, the droughts, the wildfires, um, and so on. And so that pollution comes from uh, the burning of fossil fuels that have been extracted from inside the, the body of the earth. And so I came to realize that these two megatrends, um, it's not only that they were happening, the crisis is really that we, as a collective human species, don't seem to be able to properly perceive it and act to change course. And so there's already a lot of data and science and technology, more than enough to prove it and to solve it. But clearly that's not the issue. There's something deeper happening here. This is a spiritual and cultural and moral crisis. And it's specifically about the need for human beings to connect and belong to the earth, to this planet, to our mother. Who's Absolutely, we forget the connection that we have. We remove ourselves from it. And now is the time to reconnect. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to say that traditional indigenous peoples have never lost that connection. Um, that is why they warned us for so long about the trajectory we're on and have done their best to tend to their own cultures and traditions, even amidst the genocidal forces of colonialism and neocolonialism. And so we know today 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is in the hands of indigenous peoples. And we can see why they are so gifted in helping so many of us understand how we got to this point in order to help us break free, break through and come back into balance and peace. And so at Center for Earth Ethics, we have this cornerstone program, the original caretakers program, which exists to honor, learn from and support indigenous peoples. And I am here to introduce the woman who is now the senior fellow uh, for original caretakers at Center for Earth Ethics, who is a, 
a friend and somebody who I deeply respect as an elder, and that is Mona Palaka. Mona is a teacher, a facilitator, and a thought leader. She's an enrolled member of the Colorado River Indian tribe, has held positions of responsibility within that community. She's also an elder of Havasupai, Tewa, and Hopi descent, who is guided by the original instructions of these peoples. And she's the founder and, and president and faculty member of the Turtle Island Project, a member of the Healing the Border Project, which is an indigenous alliance uh, without borders project. And she's a founding member of the International Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers. She works so beautifully as, as a teacher uh, for so many people with water, with women, with cultures, with communities, um, with understanding all the dimensions of, of this challenge that we're in. And so um, I am truly honored to, to present to you uh, Mona Palaka. Thank you. It's an honor to have you, Mona. Thank you very much. And thank you, Karena, for that beautiful introduction as well. Uh, Mona, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. First of all, I'd just like to greet each and every one of you, Camille, which is um, a greeting to each and every one of you of this good day, this day that is set aside to acknowledge and um, recognize the gifts and uh, the blessings of the love and compassion of our mother, the earth. And uh, I come to you, I am at on the uh, traditional traditional lands and territory of the uh, Thano Atham Nation in uh, the Tucson, Arizona area, Southern Arizona. And uh, I am of the Havasupai, Hopi and Tewa uh, people, uh, the people of the blue water and the people of the uh, peace, uh, the Pueblo people. So I'm grateful to be here. Thank you very much. I, um, I'm glad that I could be part of this program uh, for many, many, many years. Um, as I was growing up, I, I have heard from my elders about the, um, what's called the original instructions. And the in original instructions were, were uh, teachings that were passed on to us, that were given to, the, uh, to us two-legged beings as human beings, five-fingered ones, as, as some, uh, as we identify ourselves uh, among indigenous people, and also as the people. And um, uh, all over the world, the, uh, there are these human beings who have uh, not separated themselves from the land, from the water and all of nature. And these are indigenous cultures that have um, an unbroken chain that extends back uh, from that time we say when we uh, originated into this world. And uh, at, from that time we were told and given instructions about how we were to live here on mother earth and how we were to um, take care of her because she takes care of us. And that, um, and that we would um, pass this knowledge. It was our, our responsibility to pass this knowledge on and our way of being, our way of living, to pass it on to our children, grandchildren, and the future generations, that we were to um, maintain um, this a way of... Um, our ethics and our heritage of how to live here, how to live on Mother Earth. And so um, we have been carrying on throughout the world. Indigenous people continue to uh, maintain their uh, original instructions on how to live in the part of uh, the world where the creator put them. And, um, and also that um, it's, um, it's also our, um, if you look at the world, if you look at Mother Earth, you will see 
that uh, just as uh, Karenna just mentioned that the uh, indigenous people steward 80% of the global biodiversity. And if you look at Mother Earth, you would see the contrast between where the lands of the indigenous people are that remain pretty much the way it was when they originally established themselves here on Mother Earth at those locations. So uh, we have been uh, carrying on these ways and, um, and if you look at the various regions of Mother Earth, how, uh, let's say, look at the Arctic Circle, the people of the Arctic and how they live and how they are able to sustain themselves in the Arctic where I know I certainly wouldn't be able to go up there and be able to adjust or survive in that environment. And on the other hand, the indigenous people of the Arctic to come down into the desert lands of the of uh, southern Arizona or else to go to the desert lands of um, Africa, uh, they would not be able to survive. I mean, it would be very difficult and it would take the, um, the goodwill and compassion of the indigenous people of those places to embrace them and to show them how to survive, share the survival skills with them, the survival knowledge of what to eat, how to keep themselves uh, warm or how to survive in the desert climates. And so this is, um, you know, this is how, what we're faced with here today. Um, and so, Survival is um, something that we as indigenous people have always, always been instructed to, to um, we've all been instructed to maintain um, those practices about how we are to uh, uh, maintain this delicate balance. And this is what my mother told me. She said, we live in a very delicate balance. Her people, the Havasupai people who are living at the bottom of the Grand Canyon and their land base where they live, their village is one mile wide and three miles long. And she told me and that we live in a very delicate balance. We must maintain that balance in order for us to continue to exist. And, um, and oftentimes, you know, when we're talking about um, the world, when we talk about populations, what is it, 8 billion people, something like that? I, I'm not sure anymore, but I know when it comes to us as indigenous people, for instance, again, the Havasupai people, there are about, um, let's say, at the most 800 Havasupai tribal members. That's pretty small. And so we're very conscious about survival. We're very conscious about maintaining our sacred instructions about how to live in this delicate balance, which also includes, you know, living with the seasons and how the seasons are, knowing knowing what the seasons will be and how to prepare for them. 
and how to make sure that the children and are instructed on how to uh, prepare, you know, for their own survival. And of course, the number one things that we need for our survival is to have water, to have clean air, to have the land to where we're going to live, our land base on Mother Earth. And to have our our foods and um, our indigenous people, we have our food systems that have been passed on again um, throughout time. And, um, and so it's important for us to continue to maintain that. And, um, and so we, we were told, I was told as a young, a young lady that, um, there would come a time when, um, the indigenous people would remind the ones who have forgotten about how to take care of our mother, the earth, and how to make sure that we maintain that delicate balance. And, um, and so our um, voice today is, is being included, and I'm, I'm really grateful for that, that um, the indigenous people are uh, being able to come to the table, so to speak, to share uh, the knowledge and the wisdom of the original instructions. I think um, across the board, it seems like indigenous peoples, and it does not matter where your peoples are from, it seems that there has been prophecy that says now is our time. Stories have been shared, whether you are here um, in the tribal lands. I mean, I, I am sitting here of the lands of the Arapaho and the Cheyenne and the Navajo and uh, Shoshone and they're in uh, Apache. This is the land of the peoples here. And I've heard the stories of now is the time for indigenous peoples to lead the way from my people, from the Tzalagi people, from Cherokee people, the Eastern Band, the same thing. I've heard the stories from the Sami people, from Finland, the same thing. Mm -hmm. And from African nations, the same. Now is the time. It is to be reminded, we have forgotten. It is to be reminded. I spoke earlier about, I truly believe that it is the whisper of our ancestors. Every, every life, every time someone comes into this world, it is the whisper of the ancestors of who we are. And then society over the next five or six years tells us to ignore that. You know, Ignore your, your imagination. That's just your imagination. Children know. They are close to, to spirit, to source. They know. And then we spend the rest of our days reminding ourselves and each other of who we are and why we are, our purpose and our connection with mother and all. Um, so I thank you for sharing these words, Mona, because it's so crucial to, to our future ancestors, for, for those, those generations to come, you know. I look, I look to my children, to my girls, for that guidance. I sit quietly oftentimes now to listen to what they have to say. And I continue to do the same with younger people. I don't know if you were able to see earlier, we had some of the youth. We had youth from Latvia as well as youth from Colorado that spoke. Yeah. And we'll end from Haiti. Um, and we will have more a little bit later today. Great. Yes. 
it's important to include everyone. Absolutely. Everyone. Absolutely. And it's certainly because we lost our way along the way and we've left a little bit. Actually, we've left a large mess for our future, for our children and theirs. Mm -hmm. So we have an obligation and accountability that we have to, we have to atone for. Right. So, and it's in your leadership and yours as well, Corinna, that those changes get to happen. This awareness is key. You know, there are a number of people we cannot, they, they don't know what to do until you tell them. Right. It's, it's right. not so much of a denial for them. It's just, I need guidance. Maybe I don't have an awareness. How many came to the lands when it was Dakota access crisis moment, which still continues? How many from all over the world came in support of and said, how do we help? And also, how do we relate to this on our own lands for our own people when we go home? We have to remember that we are every drop of that water. Yes. That is who we are. Yes. I think that one of the things that um, many times is overlooked is that, um, you know, I, when I think about the water, I think, well, how old is that water? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not just right there. It comes from a watershed, from the ridge, we say, from the ridge to the reef. And there's this whole system and that is important. And I think I had a picture that was going to be uh, posted. And it's a picture of um, the water, uh, the river systems or the river basins of the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if they have that picture to put up, but um, I, I wanted to show that picture because what it does is if you haven't recognized or you don't understand what we mean when we say the mother is, the earth is our mother, that it is a living, it's a living being. Mm -hmm. well, if you look at the river basin of our country, our home lands, you will understand what we mean when we say Mother Earth is alive, that our water is our, is her bloodline. It's our lifeline. It is. And, uh, and the same thing with all the, um, all of the minerals, all of, all of the, her whole body, they all have a purpose for her existence and her health, just like us. And so um, I, I just wanted to mention that um, right now. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, I, it's my pleasure. And um, I'm so grateful that you, both of you, were able to join us today uh, because these are the stories that we need to hear. Uh, we need to have that recognition of our connectedness. And um, I'm hoping that we can uh, bring up that image that you were discussing. Um, will you say, okay, Corinna just sent me a note. Excuse me. Thank you so much. Yes, I know. I know that 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 uh, that we're working on the image, and um, in any case, people are welcome to visit uh, Center for Earth Ethics, our our website, and if the image doesn't come up during this program, we'll post it there, and we'll have a um, more words from Mona um, on that on that website, Center for Earth Ethics dot org, and um, I just want to say that I I. Indigenous knowledge is so powerful and is still with us. And the way that many of us um, 
and I'm speaking from Lenape land. Uh, apologies for not saying that uh, at the beginning. Um, but those of us who who are in this process of of understanding the context of our time and our place and our situation and are are seeking to live in balance or seeking to reconnect. Um, I just want to say that um, if you support traditional indigenous peoples in, in their work, in keeping their knowledge, uh, then you get the great blessing of, of, of being a part of something that is truly in alignment with the laws of nature, with creator, with creation. We've designed a, a kind of society that's put itself against, like antagonistic towards the laws of nature. And it, it, it is such a blessing that we are able to have teachers and guides to help us find our way back, to be in alignment and balance that way. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to share this, this, this conversation um, and to continue to learn from, from Mona. I thank you, Alicia, for your vision and leadership um, and everyone at Her Many Voices. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just one question. So how do people, how do, how do you support the Center for Earth Ethics? How can we support? Well, we would be so happy if you would sign up for our newsletter and, uh, and then hear more from us about our events. You can register and come to events. You can take uh, classes when we offer them. You can obviously donate if you want to, um, but really to be present in the conversation with us, um, so that because it's always evolving, as we know, and it's dynamic, I think uh, the first I would ask is that you follow us on social media and you sign up for our newsletter. And that way you won't you won't miss anything because we put it all out through there, including uh, Mona's wonderful teachings and guidance as well. Thank you for that question, Alicia. OK, and um, and at that point, hopefully we will uh, we'll be able to see the photo, too, through the newsletter or through the through the links onto the website. Absolutely. Maybe we can post this conversation, and then uh, and then we can pull some of the highlights into a into a blurb that includes the photo. That would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Ladies, um, any other any other information or wisdom you want to share before we sign off? I'll just sing a little song real quick. Okay. Ah, wonderful. We sang today. We sang today. We sang today, 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 we sang today. Bakani va, 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 bakani va. Eskali, 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 eskali. Blessings to everyone. Blessings to our mother, the earth. That was beautiful, Mona. Thank you so very much. Thank so you. very much. All right. Ladies, have a beautiful and blessed rest of your day. We are now traveling across the pond to, well, Numba is actually from Tanzania, but he is right now in Kenya. I'm hoping you will stay on and watch what he has to share because he has created a video game that honors Mother Earth and the wisdom of our ancestral voices, especially those from the matriarchal lineage. So, and we know we need more of this kind of thing because we have so many of these games that are out there that are nothing but violence and destruction. So the fact that this, this man has created something of... Uh, of respect mm. and creation in that story is important. Mm. So, all right. Thank and you. Ladies, Greetings and you. thank you. <laughs> Greetings, um, Corinne. <clears throat> excuse me, Corinne and, and, and uh, Mama Mona Palaka. Thank you. I, I loved everything you all were talking about. And I, um, I really thank you, Alicia, for helping to put this together. Um, this is a tremendous event that you're doing, and um, it really is, it's giving voice to the voices that need to be some of the louder voices in the room, because we've been through centuries of, of, of many voices that are the loudest voices in the room actually have been the most destructive. 
So it's just good to see um, empowerment happening all through uh, this process. And that's what I'm hoping to do with this game, Earth Cipher. So um, I have a slideshow that I think that they're pulling up that I'll kind of talk through. Um, and um, I just want to talk really about what this is. So yes, we're currently in, in, in ten well, we live in Tanzania, but we're um, I'm currently in Kenya um, to do this broadcast. So either way, we're in East Africa. So I apologize if the connection may not be, you know, always 100% the way it would as if, it, you know, if you're getting it locally. Um, but hopefully somebody will give me a nudge if the audio or video is not coming through. Um, but yes, yeah, so um, what I'll do is while I'm talking, they're working with me. The Her Many Voices people are working with me with the slideshow. I'm not running it, so I'll just say next slide for every time I want the next slide. Um, so yes, the I I am making this game. It's called Earth Cipher. So it's not a completed game yet, it's a work in progress. And so I want to talk to you about what this is. I have some visuals where you can actually see the video of what it looks like as we go through. So um, next slide, please. So the question is, um, you know, uh, who am I and why am I making a mobile game about saving the planet? So, you know, my name is Inmuta Jones. Um, I'm a software engineer. I'm a game developer. I'm an educator. And I'm also a father of five. So those are some of my big reasons of why I'm doing this. Um, right there, you see a picture of me, my wife, and our youngest daughter she, by a baobab tree in Tanzania. This is, on the, this is on the block. This is actually right next to our house in Tanzania. And this is one of these indigenous trees. These baobab trees live for centuries, you know, even thousands of years. And um, they represent uh, the traditions of our ancestors, and they also just represent the continuous um, respect for the earth that happens when you have indigenous people in charge of taking care of these communities um, and earth spaces. So we're just kind of respecting the tree here. Next slide. Um, so I'm making, why I'm making the games um, is basically, um, for four main reasons. Um, the first reason, next slide, is that I'm making a game that has, you know, I make games that have characters that you typically don't see in video games. So you typically don't see indigenous people in video games. And you also don't typically see indigenous women in video games. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see black, um, you know, or, or people of color, indigenous people of color, in games that aren't one dimensional for the most part. <clears throat> and the list goes on. You don't see black men or indigenous um, and people of color who are men in, in multifaceted roles in video games. It's always very flat. And video games in general, typically, um, you know, the, the themes in some of these games don't really give you a chance to really see characters in a, in a full light. Everything is very flat. So my games are more three dimensional and they, 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 they show basically who I am and where I come from, my communities and communities here in Africa. Um, these are people who don't really have a voice in games. Uh, usually if you see somebody who's indigenous in a game, I mean, they're like an accessory or they're doing some, some stereotypical thing that you've seen in like movies or something, but it has nothing to do with indigenous people. Next slide. Um, also, I'm making games about places that you don't typically see in games. So. You'll see in a minute when we show the video in Earth Cipher, there are places, the theme of the game is that you play um, as an indigenous person and also as an indigenous animal who have a relationship, um, who both realize that the planet is, is endangered. The indigenous, you're playing as an endangered species who realize that they are endangered, but then you're also playing it as an endangered human because all humans on the planet are endangered because of the way we're treating the planet. But the places that you see are places where some of these indigenous animals are. So we're in Tanzania now because the black rhino is one of the endangered species who, you know, who's in low numbers now. Other locations include Sri Lanka, Zambia, Ethiopia, Mongolia, Alaska, Galapagos Islands. So I've chosen places where they're indigenous communities. And then also so I can have characters who have these symbiotic relationships with the animals. And they're both fighting to save the planet. Next slide. And then I'm sending messages that you typically don't see in games. So, you know, themes like reducing your carbon footprint, um, how to live more naturally, how to create climate 
uh, resilient communities. These are things that um, that um, that were just talked up about, you know, by our previous speakers, um, uh, uh, Mama Mona Polaka and, and Karina Gore. You know, there are um, there's just a lot of indigenous wisdom um, that is in these communities, and a lot of you know you don't see these things in the mass media uh, of entertainment. You'll see it in the academic world. Sometimes you'll see documentaries and movies. Um, but it doesn't make its way into the entertainment world in places like games very frequently. And so that's part of my mission. Um, the other thing is that, you know, my games don't feature gun violence. We're in a gun violence crisis in the United States. And mm -hmm. so many young people, teenagers think that, you know, for a game to be fun, you have to be, you know, doing mass murder. And that's just not, that's just not my lens. So um, these games, you know, I, I, my games are fun and engaging, but uh, do it in a way that we don't have to perpetuate some of the ills that our planet has been experiencing um, over the you know the past several hundred years when we've been focusing on the wrong things. Next slide. And most of all, I'm making games because I'm building a vision of the planet that we want to pass on to our grandchildren. Uh, you always have to have a vision of where the planet is going. You know, if you don't know where you're going, then you can number one, get completely overwhelmed by the problem because you think you're so oppressed by the problem that you don't have a vision of where you're going. Um, and then number two, the vision, it just helps to be a common language with people and say, yes, this is our goal. Where our goal is to reduce our carbon footprint. Our footprint. I loved um, what um, uh, Mrs. Gore said about um, the two megatrends of depletion and pollution. You know, Our goal is to, to reduce those so significantly that we can have beautiful, areas, beautiful lands, beautiful countryside, beautiful, you know, areas in our communities that look the way they did before we spoiled them. So having a lodestar is important. Next slide. So now we're going to go ahead. I'm going to play the trailer. It's a short trailer, it's six minutes long, but I really encourage you to watch this because then you can kind of see the visual of what the game looks like, as opposed to me just talking. And then after that, then I have a few last words and then we're done. So um, please watch this video. I don't hear the audio though. Pause the, yeah, we could restart the video so that the audio is playing. Again, the joy of technical, those modern challenges that we're dealing with. <laughs> yeah. It may, uh, you don't have headphones on, do you? No. Okay. I think I hear it. Yeah. And turn up the, vo turn up the speakers on your computer too. My grandmother passed to her young ancestors 20 years ago today. And now those dreams have started coming to me. My name is Amuta Jones. I'm a software engineer, 3D artist, and technology educator. I'm also the founder of Media Breeze Multimedia, 
and I'm here today to talk to you because we are raising seed capital for our latest work and development, a mobile game for iPhone and Android, and it's called Earth Cypher. The vision for Media Breeze Multimedia is to use video games the way Spike Lee used film in the early 1990s. The overall idea is that you're taking a medium that's been around for a long time, and you make it a vehicle for socially progressive messages, but you do it in a fun and engaging way that is also new. Modern games are like film in that particular way. They reach millions of people and they can address some pretty heavy topics while also possibly remaining fun and entertaining. Earth Cypher is a game about economic justice. It uses the environment as a lens to explore that topic, but in a way that is lighthearted and fun and for all ages. You play as an endangered species fighting to save the planet. Your antagonists are a whole squad of mechanical minions that are infecting the land with artificial trees. The minions plant trees in the ground right beside normal trees, but the mechanical trees, as they mature, they begin to suck out all the resources and nutrients from the ground and turn those resources into dollars. The way the resources are being exploited is not sustainable, and the communities around that land are devastated, both physically and economically. So in the process, the mechanical minions and their masters are making money. Now, a cipher is a circle, but a cipher also represents a puzzle. So in this game, the cipher represents the fusion of modern technology and indigenous wisdom. As an endangered species, you have to figure out how to use this magical cipher to get powers that will allow you to handle these minions. This is a game about choices. Once you get the powers from the cipher, how will you solve the problem of the environment being destroyed at the hands of these minions? You can try to decommission them. You can try to short circuit them in hopes of reprogramming them. You can ship them away to someone else's backyard or to another place where you plan to handle them later. There are lots of choices for how to handle the situation. Any choice kicks off a series of dominoes in a cause and effect chain. Some of these effect chains are not as simple as they may appear. There will be many ways to play, many ways to win, and many ways to lose, but there's lots of fun going on along the way, and the game uses humor to engage the player in a way that's light. In each region, you play as an animal indigenous to that area. After bringing stability to each region that you're in, you travel to various regions and keep playing until you've liberated the planet. Games are inherently interdisciplinary. The player learns not only about science, ecology, and the environment, but also about global economics, social studies, geography, and various regions across the globe. The completed game has also been a ship with lesson plans for educators to use at home and in the classroom. We're excited about creating this game, but we can't do it alone. We're a small team building this using our own resources. In order to realize our vision for an app, we need your help. We are raising seed capital to finish the game. By getting involved, you have a chance to some pretty cool gear and higher level donors get a chance to put physical billboards inside of the game for the business or personal ads, which is exciting. Lastly, please know that when you support us, you're not just supporting this one game. We have several amazing ideas for future games and many subjects related to activism and progressive ideas, and you're helping us with one project is also helping us with the next. Thank you for your time and consideration, and we also thank you for supporting Socially Conscious Media. Munta, I've said it before, I will say it again, your work is powerful and needed now more than ever, I believe. Well, thank you. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. That. I appreciate it. Yeah, I only have one minute left. So the last thing I think I would really say is just, we really need your support. We have different rounds of fundraising for this game. I'm doing a lot of this work by myself. Um, I do have a very small team um, that is helping me, but in order to pay them, I, you know, I have to make payroll every time, you know, um, twice a month. So it's been, it's been very difficult. We're in Tanzania um, <clears throat> and I have team, teams in different areas. We have a seed route, a seed uh, capital goal. If you go to mediabreeze.com right there, you can help us raise funds. We're almost to, we needed to raise uh, around 19.5 thousand. We're almost there. We're only uh, three or 4,000 dollars short of that goal, but it, that little bit of money is just going to help us with a few extra things that we need to do in order to, to reach this first goal. So we're almost there, but you know, every dollar that's contributed really helps us with 
with um, with our payroll, with with the people who are helping me helping me develop this effort. So yeah, please go to mediabreeze.com um, and click on you know it says donate, and then you can um, you can donate to this, and you know it would really help us out a lot. We will certainly be um, promoting this and playing this video um, and encouraging people to donate, 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 because we need more of this kind of work out there. Um, Thank you. Okay, we have a comment. Awesome, thank you. This is coming from Shante. Uh, awesome, this game would have made homeschooling much easier. I can't wait to see it. Absolutely, absolutely. We have thank so you. many people, especially at this time, you know, students are spending time at home and they're spending an awful lot of time doing this um, in front of things that are not healthy for them or any other living beings. So. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Shante. Yeah, the game has comes with lesson plans. So as an educator, I'm always thinking in terms of lesson plans. So the game, when we release the game, is going to come with lesson plans for everything um, to help people who are homeschooling, which is quite a number of people right now. So. Yeah. All right, my friend. Have a beautiful night. I know it's late for you. Yeah, um, it so is. Rest <laughs> up. And thank you. we are going to head back to Haiti now.